Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, what I will try to do in a, in a few minutes is to give you the background to the Velama case, uh, as well as to uh, highlight the constitutional and historical significance of this case. I don't think it would be any exaggeration to say that this is probably one of the most important cases to have been heard by our highest courts uh, since the 1987 case of Cheng Suan Zi against the Minister for Home Affairs. I think Suan Zi is around here, yeah. right? So let, let, me, let me get into the brass tacks of this case. Just to remind you of the facts of the case, I've got a little timeline here and I realise that maybe at the back you can't see it, so I'll take you through the timeline, alright? Um, what happened was this, in, on the 14th of February 2012, this was not very long uh, after the 2011 general elections, uh, the seat in Aokang uh, SMC was declared vacant because the incumbent MP, uh, Yo Shin Leong, the Workers' Party, had been expelled from his party. Now, under the... What's a funny sound? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, okay. Um, <clears throat> Under our constitution and under our Parliamentary Elections Act, uh, if you lose uh, membership in the party under which you had been elected, you will have to vacate your seat in Parliament. This is what we call in uh, politics and in law, anti-hopping laws. In other words, you can't jump around from one party to another party and yet hold on to your seat in Parliament. By the way, there are no anti-hopping laws in Malaysia, for example, which is why sometimes you get to hear about all these uh, defections going on in Parliament between the BN guys and the uh, uh, Kedilan and so on and so forth, right? Uh, or becoming independent all of a sudden, like in the Perak crisis. Eh? So um, we have anti-hopping laws. This was intentionally inserted into the Constitution after 1961, when the, uh, the uh, uh, section of the PAP broke away uh, from the party uh, to form the Barisan Socialists and yet were able to retain their seats because there was no such prohibition at the time. So, uh, what happened in 2012, of course, was that uh, the seat in Hong Kong SMC was declared vacant. So, question, of course, and on everybody's lips, uh, especially after the 2011 elections, was will there be a by-election or when? Not so much whether, but when will the by-election be? Now, there were a number of statements made by Prime Minister Lee, Lee Sen Loong that uh, he hasn't decided if he would call an election. Uh, and in any case, it would be up to him to decide if he wanted to call an election. All right? um, and so, uh, of course, many of us who have been studying uh, the Constitution say, no, 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 he has really uh, no discretion. He must call an election. Of course, the Constitution doesn't specify when he has to call it. So this is where the nub of the issue is. This is what the big contention, the big point is all about. Does the Prime Minister have a discretion? Can he decide that he wants to have an election or let's just ride it out? Let's wait until 2016 or whatever and then, you know, let Aukang be without an MP, right? Now, what happened was, um, in, in, in less than a month, uh, Madam Velama files an originating summons uh, asking for uh, uh, the court to declare, right, that the Prime Minister has a duty to call an election. So this is just slightly over two weeks after Yeo Shin Leong had been expelled from the party. And of course, the Attorney General's Chambers files an opposition and, uh, because she had actually been granted leave. I, I won't go into the technical details about leave because it, it's horribly, horribly technical. But basically, if you want to take a, course to court, uh, a, a case to court, you must have what we call standing. In other words, you must have a right to bring the case. Uh, you can't, any, not anybody can bring any case to court. So you must be, in a way, somehow affected by the outcome of the case. I can't be a busybody. Now, some jurisdictions you can, okay? It's called public interest litigation. So in some countries, uh, like in India, I can, on behalf of a group of people, let's say I'm a, uh, I'm a head of NGO and I take care of, say, migrant workers, I can, even though I'm not a migrant worker myself, go and file a suit in court uh, because I represent this sort of public interest. In Singapore, we don't have this. In Singapore, they are very strict with it. They will look at the rules of the court and unless you have been somehow directly affected by the outcome of the controversy, you will not be allowed to bring the case to court. So in this case, uh, she was granted leave and the opposition came from the Attorney General's Chambers to say, no, you, you should not have given her leave. Now, in all the lawyers here, so practicing lawyers around here, I, I, I wouldn't presume 
to, 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 to say much more about this other than the fact that the easiest way to win a case is a technical knockout. If I can knock you out, I don't even fight the case. If I say you have no right to come before the court, I've won already because you don't even bring the case. So I don't even need to go into arguments. Right? So anyhow, mm, um, uh, uh, seven days later, uh, after the uh, OS had been filed, the Prime Minister actually declared in Parliament, I have not yet decided on the timing of the by-election. In deciding on the timing, I will take into account all relevant factors, including the well-being of Afghan residents and so on. So this is, uh, this is quite clearly, uh, I don't know if, if, if the filing of the suit had actually precipitated this. I suspect it did. It came within a week and he's actually saying, I will hold an election. I will hold an election. Not that I have a choice anymore. Uh, nonetheless, right, uh, uh, two months later, uh, the Prime Minister advises the President and a writ of election is issued. Once a writ of election is issued, it means there will be an election, there will be nomination day, etc. So what happened is, by the time uh, uh, this case went up to court, and of course the result we all know, on the 26th of May, uh, the election, uh, was, uh, by election was held, and it was won by Workers' Party's Per Ming Huat. So um, the thing is this, right? Before um, the, 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 the case was actually heard, elections had already um, uh, been held. So what does this mean? It means that um, technically the case was moot. In other words, there's no need to decide the case because if I give you a declaration, so what? You have your election, right? You, you, your main complaint is that there's no election. Now you already had election, so why do I need to make any kind of declaration? Now this is another way in which courts sometimes avoid making difficult decisions. In other words, if, if, no, but this is practical, right? If there's no more life issue, why do I need to go and make long pronouncements? No, 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 no necessity for doing so. So this is the first point I want you to note, which is very remarkable that they could have knocked this case out on technicality. And courts have done that before in other cases. But they did not. They say, well, never mind, let's proceed because there are questions of public interest that need to be addressed, right? About the right to vote, about the uh, discretion of the Prime Minister, the interpretation of Section 46, uh, Article 46 and so on. So, two issues came up before the court. The first issue had to do with standing. I won't deal too much with that because that's very technical. Whether or not the court under Order 53 of the court uh, had prerogative to uh, uh, issue the declaratory reliefs. I'm not going to deal with that. That's very, very technical. The second question is a much more important and uh, salient one for us, which is that whether the Prime Minister has the discretion to call or not to call a by-election to fill the elected member's vacancy, and if he must call for such a by-election, what period uh, must he do so? Now, one of the arguments that had been advanced was that he had no discretion, all right? That one we all agree. Uh, and, but then it, he had also had to issue, uh, exercise his discretion within three months. There's a lot of stuff in the law reports about this three months, which I will not go into because, uh, you know, frankly, I didn't think that that was a very valid argument. Because quite clearly in 1963, there was a three-month requirement, right? To hold a by-election that was actually taken out. So once it's taken out, well, then it's, it's really a question of, uh, you know, it's quite discretionary. All right, so what is the relevant law that we need to deal with? Uh, there are two sections uh, uh, of legislation that I need to draw your attention to. The first one is Article 49.1 uh, of the Constitution. It says, where the seat of a member not being a non-constituency member, i.e. NCMP, has become vacant for any reason other than a dissolution of parliament, the vacancy, and I emphasize the words, shall be filled. The vacancy shall be filled in a manner provided for or under any law relating to parliamentary elections for the time being in force. Note the words, shall be filled. It doesn't say may be filled, it says shall be filled. So the question is, shall equals must or doesn't equal must. That's, that's the first thing. The second law that needs to be dealt with is Section 52 of the Interpretation Act because it goes back to the timing. Assuming that the Prime Minister has to call an election, when? Right? 
And there's nothing in the, either the Parliamentary Elections Act nor the Constitution to specify a timing. So under general principles of interpretation, what do you do? Well, we've got the help of Section 52 of the Interpretation Act, which says that, well, where no time is prescribed or allowed within which anything shall be done, that thing shall be done with all convenient speed and as often as the prescribed occasion arises. So this is sort of a general interpretation act. You run to it uh, as your first port of call because if there are doubts you know, as to the meaning of certain words and so on, interpretation act actually covers quite a fair bit of it, like you know, duration, time, days, etc., etc. So you run there and you say, oh, okay, if there's no timing prescribed, then it shall be done with all convenient speed. Right? With all convenient speed suggests that the prime minister not only must call an election, but he must do so you know, within reason. He can't drag his feet for too long. All right, what happened in the High Court? In the High Court, you had a, a, a rather interesting uh, judgment from uh, Mr. Justice uh, Philip Pillay. Uh, I, I recall uh, bumping into him two days after he had rendered this decision. And, um, and I had not yet seen the judgment. So he saw me in the corridor. Uh, and then he called me and said, hey, Kevin, your article was very useful. I cited you in my judgment, in which case, sent <laughs> sent some shivers down my spine. I don't know why. You, you know, quoting you doesn't mean always good. Okay, could have said, you know, Professor Tan got it completely wrong. Right? I mean, a anyhow, it, it was a historical piece I had written many years ago about tra tracking the origins of the legislature and the powers of the legislature down through history. Uh, I, I must say that uh, while he got that part of it right, I think he misinterpreted. Uh, the meaning of it. Uh, what, what did he say? Well, he said, if we look at the internal structure of the Constitution, and here he focused on what we call Part 4. Part 4 of the Constitution uh, contains what we call the fundamental liberties of the Constitution. So your right to free speech, your right to life and liberty, and so on. That's in Part 4. He said, looking at the internal structure of Part 4, it is clear that the rules relating to the filling of a seat was different from the different parts, different types of MPs. In other words, um, if you know, remember from Article 49, one I showed you just now, there is a rule for normal MPs and there's a rule for N and NC MPs. So different rules. So he said, if there are different rules for filling different seats, then the word shall be filled. He, has, he, he, he didn't quarrel about shall be filled. He quarreled about by an election. So what does it mean by an election? He says, well, there are two ways to look at it. One is we look at election as a process, and we, two, we can look at election as an event. What does that mean? A process means uh, if, in other words, uh, how do we put this? Let's say um, uh, we, want to, we, want to, uh, we want to break an egg. Okay? There are two ways to break an egg. You can crack it. Uh, uh, you know, at the edge of a bowl, or there are multiple ways actually breaking an egg, right? Or you can poke your finger in it, whatever it is. He says, it's about the process. How do you fill the seat? Not that it must be by an election. Now, how did he arrive at this uh, fascinating conclusion? He looked at the history. This is where my, my article uh, was quite useful to him, or so he thought, right? Uh, he said, well, look at the whole history of the scheme after the Second World War of how they constructed the Legislative Council, subsequently the Legislative Assembly. And it was very clear throughout that there are two ways to fill a seat in the Assembly. One is by way of nomination. In other words, the governor had the right to nominate certain members, certain temporary members, for example. And there's a second way, which is by way of elections during what you call the general election. So there are two modalities, there are two ways you can do this. And so, if we look at Article 49.1, when we say it's either process or event, I would say it is quite clearly process. So therefore, yes, it simply says that the, it shall be filled by an election. It doesn't say that it, uh, you know, by, by way of an election, rather than you must have an actual election. Okay. Now, I hope this is not too complicated, but it, you know, just go back to my analogy of breaking an egg. You can break an egg in many, many ways. But the question here is, he's not quarrelling about the fact that you have to break the egg. 
He's just saying that, well, you have to do it in this particular way. And he doesn't talk about timing. And again, he goes on and looks at, you know, the history of the uh, removal of the three-month requirement. All right. What happened? Of course, this we, we thought was a ridiculous uh, 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 interpretation of section, uh, Article 49. Uh, this is when, uh, you know, uh, Ravi's team uh, were, were chatting me, with me about this and I thought, no, 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 this is not the way to interpret this. Because one of the big problems was that while it may have been historically accurate to say that there were two ways of filling a seat, that disappeared by 1959. Because by 1959, number one, you no longer had a British governor. Secondly, by 1959, you had a completely elected uh, self-governing uh, uh, legislature. So there is only one way to fill a seat. There is no more nomination after 1959. So the Court of Appeal case went up. Most of the judgment dealt with the practical and procedural aspect of it, which I didn't want to go into in great detail. But it said quite clearly, um, and, and this is where I, I, I wanted to re-emphasize the first point I made. They could have just decided it on a technicality and said, look, you know, we don't need really to decide this matter because it is moot. Uh, elections were held. We could, and, and in fact, they did decide on that point. They said, well, the case is dismissed. Well, they could have stopped there. That would have taken them two pages. They went on for 34 pages. Okay? Why? Well, they felt that it was important to deal with the two points. One, about the nature of the standing, when you can apply for a case in court, right? Uh, to, to bring a case to court, that was number one. And the second one, more importantly, was the Article 49. How do you interpret Article 49? And so they read the judgment of uh, Justice Philip Pille and said, well, it was all very interesting and detailed and interest, uh, uh, on how he got at the historical origins of it. It's not very helpful. Because if we look at the Constitution as it stands, right, um, it makes it clear that we have what is called a Westminster-style Constitution. Westminster-style Constitution, by the way, the term is used to describe those kinds of constitutions that borrow uh, from the British system. So what, what, what are the characteristics? Basically, you have a head of state who is not the head of government. Okay? Um, so you have a queen who reigns but does not rule, no real power in the head of state. Uh, real power resides in the cabinet. Uh, you have a primarily elected legis legislature from which you draw your executive. Not the same as the presidential system where they separate the two quite clearly. Yeah? So um, you said, well, if we look at the structure and the purpose and functions of a Westminster style constitution, elections is key. You have to have elections because that's the only way you fill your seats every five years or whatever time you deem the life of parliament should be. And therefore, it is very clear just looking at that structure that the prime minister has a duty to call a by-election. Right? Nothing to do with process, nothing to do with... Uh, and in any case, there's a problem, right? Because what makes you think that just because it's a process is not also the event. The event can be the process at the same time. Right? So, therefore, it's very clear here that based on the Westminster style constitution, uh, PM has a duty, he has no discretion. And because no time has been prescribed, uh, let's look at section 52 of the Interpretation Act, which says that it shall be done uh, with all due convenient speed. And here, they went on to say that, well, in considering what is due, all due convenience speed, the Prime Minister has the widest latitude. Here's where he has discretion. Look at the situation, you look at the, well, you know, anything, right? International uh, situation, you look at the economy, and then you can determine, right? So on that basis, I think it would be quite difficult to challenge the Prime Minister's discretion on when to hold the election so long as, he, he, you know, he can be shown to be making some kind of effort to think about uh, the right time to hold such an election. So, let me um, deal with the key significance of the case. Uh, as I've said, the case could have been easily dismissed on a technical can technicality, but it wasn't. And so they went on to discuss the importance of Article uh, 49.1. The most important aspect is that there is in fact no enumerated right to vote under Part 4 of the Constitution. Right? I will show you what the rights are under Part 4 in a moment. But that it is not there. 
it is actually not written into the Constitution. Now, uh, l let me just share with you. Back in 1966, when they had the last Constitutional Commission, the Wee Chong Jin Commission, they actually said that the people of Singapore, and here I quote them, the people of Singapore have thus had little experience of general elections, nor can it be safely assumed that they have grown up to cherish as an inalienable right, the right to be governed by a government of their own choice, expressed in periodic and general elections by universal and equal suffrage and held by secret vote. With this limited experience of elections, we do not consider it safe to assume that a significant proportion a significant proportion of people of Singapore will be able to realise until it is too late to prevent it that any inroads have been made into the democratic system of general elections by a future government intent on undermining first and ultimately destroying the practice of democracy in Singapore. We therefore think it both necessary and wise to recommend that this right should be written into the constitution as a fundamental right and should be entrenched in the constitution in the same manner as the other fundamental rights we have recommended. We accordingly recommend that there should be a new article in the constitution granting to the citizens of Singapore the right to elect a government of their choice as expressed in general elections held at reasonable periodic intervals by secret vote. This is uh, Wee Chong Jin Commission, right? Writing in to say, hey, it's a bit dangerous, just assume that because you've got a Westminster style constitution, you will always have it. Let's not trust it to, you know, what do you call it? Constitutional culture, politics and so on. Let's write it down. Let's put it in the constitution and entrench it. And the idea of entrenchment, by the way, which was not accepted by Parliament, was two-thirds majority at a national referendum. If you want to remove any fundamental liberty, you can only do so by uh, getting the agreement of two-thirds majority at a national referendum. Of course, like most other recommendations of the Wee Chong Jin Commission, this was never accepted. Now, if, uh, you, you know, if you really want to be inspired somewhat, uh, I would recommend you reading the Wee Chong Jin Commission report. It is actually a fantastic report uh, about you know, uh, all sorts of things about rights, democracy, safeguarding interests, minority rights, and so on. Um, the sad thing, of course, was that uh, even though we had such a commission, uh, many of the recommendations, most of them actually were in fact rejected by parliament. Right? So this was one of them. So at the time, this is really, really interesting, right? Because 1966, recommendation was we embed it in the constitution. Parliament said no. Now, okay, Parliament says no. Then what happens after that? Um, well, uh, in, um, in 1990, in the 1990s, I forget the date now, uh, the question came before Parliament as to whether or not voting was a right or was it a privilege? Okay. And the leader of the house, Wong Kan Seng, at the time he said, while the constitution does not contain an express declaration of the right to vote, I have been advised by the Attorney General, even before today, that the right to vote at parliamentary and presidential elections is implied within the structure of our constitution. We have a parliamentary form of government, the constitution provides for regular general elections to make up parliament and establishes representative democracy in Singapore. So, the right to vote is fundamental to a representative democracy, which we are. And that is why we have the Parliamentary Elections Act to give effect to this right. Okay, I'm not quite sure the last part is correct. I mean, just because you have an act doesn't mean you, you assume that the right exists. But here you are. Here's what the parliament has said. So, um, this went on, right? My, my colleague, Teo Lian, actually, uh, when, when she was an MP, when I asked the question again, well, can you tell us whether it's a right or is it a uh, privilege, right? And, um, and so she asked for clarification. This time, Law Minister K. Shamugam says, let me deal with, is it a right or a privilege? He says, Representative democracy is the very essence of our political system and voting is the foundation 
of representative democracy. The power of our citizens to vote cannot be a privilege because that would imply that there is some institution superior to the body of citizens which is in a position to grant such a privilege to the citizens. But in a free country, there is no institution that can be in such a position to grant such a privilege to the citizens. In a representative democracy like Singapore, voting is therefore a right, not a privilege. Right? And he goes on uh, 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 and, and, and elaborates. So quite clearly, uh, what is really, really interesting for a constitutional lawyer is this. If you look at part four, these are your rights under part four. Article 9 talks about the right to life and liberty. Uh, Article 10, the right against slavery. Article 11, the right against retrospective criminal law and double jeopardy. Uh, Article 12, equality and equal protection. Um, sorry, Article 13, um, uh, prohibition of banishment and the right to uh, freedom of movement. Article 14, freedom of speech, assembly and association. 15, uh, uh, right uh, to religious freedom. And finally, 16, rights in respect of education. You don't see the right to vote in here. So, to me, this is really quite remarkable that outside of these, you can embed a right that is not found here. What is even more uh, disturbing sometimes is that for those rights that are already embedded here, sometimes the court comes to a very, very strange decision that does not appear to make it such a right. One of which is the right to counsel, which I think Ravi can tell you a little bit more about under Article 9.4, which says that the person who has been charged with an offence shall as soon as may be be told of the facts uh, relating to the charge and be entitled to a legal counsel of his or her choice. The Court of Appeal, no less, has held that uh, even though this is such a, is called a, is a right under Article 9.4, such a right cannot be exercised right, until the police have finished their investigations. So, when I embed a right, it's very clear you have such a right, it's interpreted in a way against the individual, whereas here it's not even embedded, but yet you say, well, it's, it's in here. All right? And so this is where I, I, I think, you know, in a way, constitutional history uh, has been made. So with this, uh, thank you very much.